So uh, ground level is guzzle. The drinks are going to reflect the name much more straightforward, sessionable for the most part, kind of fun riffs on classics. Uh, Steve, the bar manager upstairs, likes to equate them to grilled cheese. You kind of know exactly what you're going to get when you read it on the menu. And the uh, downstairs, the drinks are a little bit more concept-driven, more experiential, I would say. And I think the food reflects that on the floors as well. Upstairs kind of leans a little bit more towards Japanese street food and izakaya fare, whereas downstairs is a little bit more elevated and elegant. We have things like a A5 Miyazaki Wagyu Sando, uni, hand rolls from Hokkaido, golden ocetra caviar, things like that. The Bar Sip and Guzzle has recently opened in New York, and we were lucky enough to get a chance to speak with head bartender Ben Yabro. He's also taken the time to show us how to make one of the drinks from the downstairs menu, the tomato tree. Now, you've got some pretty interesting alums. Yes. Who have started this bar. Do you want to tell us a bit more about who they are? Yeah, of course. So, a really awesome team that we're working with. Steve was the guy at Employees Only for 15 years. Shingo Gokan, who was the bar manager at Angel Share and has since gone on to open a number of award-winning bars throughout Asia, in Tokyo and Shanghai, as well as Okinawa. And then Mike Begale, our chef, was the executive chef at Alinea um, in Chicago. And yeah, I was, uh, I was most recently at Double Chicken Please for the past two years. So a lot of really cool experiences where we all kind of get to work together and bounce ideas off each other coming from different backgrounds to to put some put some fun things out. Is it correct to say, though, that the bar has very much Japanese influence to it? I think it's a really nice hybrid Japanese and American bar cultures. Upstairs is much more American feeling. It's kind of an homage to old New York. One of the biggest compliments we get, I think, is people say it feels like it's been here for a long time. Yeah, downstairs is, is much more... Japanese in style as far as the techniques that we're using, but the overall beverage programs, I think, kind of focus more on global flavors as opposed to being strictly Japanese. But, you know, I do think that uh, downstairs where we have a lot of nice little touches that kind of tip tip the hat to the SG Club in Tokyo, which is our sister bar. A lot of people come down and they say it feels like they're they're back in Tokyo, which is great. We're towing that line between New York and Tokyo for sure. And what are you going to be making for us today? Uh, today, I'm going to be making one of our most popular cocktails downstairs called the tomato tree. So each ingredient represents a different part of that. Really nice, bright, refreshing cocktail with some slight savory notes. And it's been one of our biggest hits since we opened. Can you run us through those ingredients? Yeah, of course. So... For the fruit, uh, we use obviously tomato, given the name, but we're doing a tomato water, so freshly juiced tomato that will clarify. It pulls out a lot of that creamy weightiness, and it leaves behind just a really nice, bright, floral acidity uh, with with still some slight savory notes. For the leaves, we have dill uh, in a part in part from a two-way infusion between gin and shochu. And basil for the garnish, just for the additional aromatic. Works really nicely with uh, with tomato. For flour, we use an elderflower liqueur. And sap, we use mastia, which is a liqueur made from gum tree resin. Really kind of got some cool piney complexities to it. It really acts as, I think, a bridge between everything else in the cocktail. When people taste this drink, what sort of flavors come to the fore? Tomato is going to be the most dominant flavor in the drink, but I think you're seeing a lot of bars start playing around with tomato water. Uh, And I think for guests who haven't had it before, it's a really pleasant surprise. I I think, you know, on the menu, this drink reads gin, fruit, leaf, flower, sap. So it doesn't really tell the whole story or list almost any of the ingredients by name. So guests really have to kind of trust us when they're ordering this one. But I think it also adds a level of intrigue, not knowing exactly what you're going to get. And for the most part, they're pleasantly surprised. Quite often, uh, this is, I think, the most common drink that we're seeing someone order a second one of. Obviously, people come in and they want to 
they want to make their way through the menu, um, given that for most people it's their first time seeing it. But a lot of times people will just keep coming back to this drink. So uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's really nice. I think it checks most of the boxes that people are looking for with a cocktail, being savory but still super super refreshing and just really easy drinking. Do you want to show us how it's made? Yeah, of course. So it's going to be a shaken cocktail. It's a very, uh, it's a, it's a lower ABV cocktail. Um, so this is going to be the dill infused gin. It's just going to be a little of that. And then for the shochu, this is going to be a shochu based off rice. We use SG shochu. It's part of our kind of parent portfolio. Shochu typically comes in 28 or 25%. ABV, but these come in at 40 or just around there, depending on the uh, depending on which one we're using. Something so low can fall flat in cocktails. It doesn't really hold up to the other ingredients just because it's so low in alcohol. So these uh, shochu are designed explicitly for cocktails, right? They're great on their own, but the idea behind them being higher in, in alcohol is just to just to hold up. Um, then for elderflower, we use Saint Germain. And then Mastia. Specifically, we're using Skinos. Oh, it's just the brand name. Um, it might mean something. I don't speak Greek. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then tomato water. So as I mentioned, very, very clear. Super delicious. I'm going to add a little bit extra. And then just to kind of balance everything out, we add a little bit of clarified lemon juice. Acts the same as a lemon, but we just want to keep the cocktail nice and clear. And then we're going to hand blend. Because the cocktail is so light and delicate, we don't want to add too much dilution by shaking too hard. So this just kind of is a little cheat code for us to add a lot of aeration. Then we have a rocks glass that is lightly salted at the rim. Now we shake. Nice fluffy texture. And then we'll garnish with a cherry tomato that's been cooked on fee and sauternes and honey. A little bit of basil. For the aroma, that's what's made true. Now, when you were blending, was that actually a milk frother that you used? Yeah, given the style that we shake, obviously with the uh, cobbler shaker, it's very difficult to dry shake. So we started using it with egg white cocktails, just to emulsify the egg white, as you would with a dry shake. But with a cobbler, it'll burst open on you. And it, it's just so efficient and effective that we've started using it with most of our shaken drinks just to add a little bit more aeration. Now, that's an unusual type of shaker to use in a bar these days. Yeah, it's you see a lot more of them in smaller cocktail bars. They don't really lend themselves to high volume. If you're going to use them, I think in the way that they've been designed to be used. You can't really double shake, can't shake and stir, so you're really only able to make one drink at a time. So 
upstairs where, you know, it's a situation of them being sometimes, you know, full bar plus three rows of people standing. And then also the whole dining room, it would just be chaos. It just wouldn't make sense. So they use a more traditional Boston shakers upstairs. Um, down here, given that it's so small and stylistically being a little bit more uh, Japanese, that's that's what we'll use. I've used them for almost 10 years now. I prefer them, but that's just me. Some people really dislike them. I just think it kind of depends on the, the style of bar. I know some, some cocktail bars will use, you know, two piece for certain cocktails and three piece for other cocktails. For us, we're, we pretty much just use the cobblers downstairs, but it's a nice kind of juxtaposition between styles and the two floors, two completely different bars just operating under the same roof. Do you think those, that style of um, shaker has any advantage over the two piece? Yeah, I think so. Given that the shaker is more, it's more ovular. There's no like joint as you would get in a two piece. So the idea being that the ice and the liquid all kind of move um, smoothly around as opposed to just hitting the two ends of the shaker. Also, when we shake, it's more kind of coming this way as it is straight. So for us, it allows us to minimize the breakage of the ice. So you're not getting the ice chips, which melt really, really quickly and can sometimes over dilute a cocktail. For us, I think it just allows us to control aeration and dilution a little bit better. For the most part, our cocktails, you know, a lot of very delicate flavors, so we don't want to add too much water. Now, I noticed also that the ice that you put into the drink hmm. was the ice from the shaker. Yes. So all of our ice down here is hand cut, even what we shake and stir on. Uh, we don't use any machine ice. It's uh, it's all Kleinbell ice. So. Very, very dense, very, very clear, really high quality. So again, the ice isn't breaking up too much in the tin. So it allows us to control that dilution a little bit better. It's also great from a sustainability perspective because the ice that we don't use at the end of the night, we just put back into the freezer and we're not having to burn our ice every night. But yeah, so it coming back from the shaker into the drink, it's rather than using fresh ice to put into the drink, which again will have to temper and when it does it'll melt this ice is the same exact temperature as the drink when it comes out of the shaker so uh also the the corners are typically kind of melted off a little bit so they're a little bit rounder um, those corners are the fastest melting part of the ice so again it's just further going into being able to control that level of dilution now you mentioned that the gin and the soshu are both deal infused how long are they infused for? Yeah, so they're cooked sous vide in vacuum bags for two hours at 52 degrees Celsius. That's typically where we'll start uh, during any kind of R&D phases. We'll start the infusion process. Once you get past that in time, you're kind of seeing diminishing returns. You're not getting much more flavor extracted out of it for the amount of time you're getting. And also anything above that temperature wise can cause some molecular breakdown in the alcohol. So it potentially won't hold on to the flavor as long as it would if you cooked it at a lower temperature. So it's kind of the sweet spot for us that two hours at 52 degrees. And if you don't have a vacuum sealer or anything, you can also with a simple meat thermometer uh, with a, with water on the stove, get the, get it to the right temperature and you can put it in a, Ziploc bag or even a mason jar and just submerge it and yeah, super easy. No, none of the cocktails we make here right now are, are really using any sort of equipment or techniques that you can't accomplish in your own home kitchen. I was about to say, is there anything in this drink that might be a little bit complicated or might trip somebody up? No, um, uh, the, I'd say Honestly, the most difficult thing to make is probably the clarified lemon juice, which is just an agar clarification. So agar, I think, is the easiest to understand. It's like a plant-based gelatin. It will we'll just heat up some lemon juice, throw that in um, the agar, and uh, stir it to kind of hydrate it, and then add it to the already cold lemon juice. It forms kind of a 
gel and then we'll whisk that and strain it through coffee filters and it comes out clear. This drink can be made, I think, just as effectively at home with regular fresh lemon juice. For us, it's just, uh, as you can see, a very clear drink and we wanted to preserve that, so we, we clarify. Well, how would you describe the menu to someone who hasn't seen it? Yeah, so the menu right now, and we'll be adding some, some more drinks next week, they're kind of broken into sections by page. So we have some drinks that are very light and refreshing, great place to start. Some drinks more on that savory side, drinks that are inspired by aroma, drinks that are, you know, more kind of slow sippers, things like boulevardiers and old fashions. Uh, and then lastly, we have ones that uh, we say are great for finishing. Uh, I think they're dessert style cocktails. Uh, and a lot of times that turns people off. But for us, it's less of about it being sweet. None of them are going to be sweet. One of them is one of the more dry drinks on the menu. But just utilizing dessert flavors, things like coffee, coconuts, chocolate, mint, things like that, but still very, very dry and refreshing. How would you describe the sort of experience that someone will have in the bar? So vastly different experiences upstairs and downstairs. Upstairs at the bar, it feels very much like a busy West Village cocktail bar. Mm -hmm. You know, great place to come with friends and, you know, have some drinks and just great music, have a good time. In the dining room, you can have a really nice dinner any night of the week downstairs. Uh, it's a little bit more intimate, a little bit more cozy. Uh, we hear a lot of times it's a great, great date spot. Every table is kind of its own little secluded corner. You can still have a full dinner experience down here. Um, all the dishes are meant to be shared. Get a few different things, you'll, you'll, you can easily fill up.